His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for never get old. Hello and welcome to the Long Island History Project, the podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I am your host. And our opening music is courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. Today we are turning back to some familiar ground, but taking a different look at it. We're talking about the American Revolution and the tumultuous times on Long Island. It was a dark period. It was a dangerous period. And we're going to be digging deep into sources you may not have ever heard of or considered. We'll be talking about oaths of allegiance, existing under seven years of military occupation, stories of loyalty and revolution, resistance and acquiescence, and the power of good record-keeping. And that's all through the hard-won knowledge and skills of today's very special guest. My name is uh, Brendan Burns. I am a genealogist with the Daughters of the American Revolution, and also in my own right, I work as the Virginia Genealogist Online. And first of all, Brendan, thank you for joining us tonight. We're on uh, Libsyn Connect. And there's a couple of strands we'll try to connect. Obviously, the genealogy is very important. We've spoken to genealogists you've specialized or you've you've got a, a lot of work in, in Long Island-based genealogy, which we'll get to, um, and the Revolutionary War, which which is a main topic of, of what we're talking about. <laughs> and I was just thinking, putting together my notes, um, the story you tell, you know, the records don't necessarily tell a narrative, but the reference resource we're going to get you to talk about as well is, is a great title for a an epic sweeping novel of the time, The Loyal and Doubtful. So just as, for a brief, for, to get us started a little bit, do you want to tell us what that re- reference resource is? And then we'll spring into the rest of the stuff. Yep, sure. Um, so I this past August released a series. It's a first series, five volumes. It's uh, The Loyal and Doubtful. And it's uh, an index to the acts of British loyalism in the greater New York and Long Island area, um, specifically during the years of the American Revolution in uh, 1775 to 1783. And... Um, it's basically counting every individual act by any person that can be identified with or had spent some time in those two in those areas, uh, also including Staten Island during that time. And it's um, the loyal and doubtful is very much inclusive of the kind of the nature of the acts themselves, whether someone can clearly be determined to be a loyalist or whether their actions were enough to warrant that they might be possibly inimical to the patriotic cause. Okay, and and we'll get deeper into the whole um, the, the meanings of all that and and the implications of all of that. But just to to stick with you for a second and back up a little bit, how does one find themselves becoming a professional genealogist? For me, it's like many other people. Um, it's it's something that came out of the family. My grandfather was the family genealogist uh, for many years, and um, I picked it up about the age of eight or nine years. Um, I was always a history brat, um, and it just kind of seem I just kind of aim myself seamlessly into that transition, and um, I went on a mad uh, mad dash to go through and document as many people as I could be related to when I was in middle school, high school, and all the way through. And um, in terms of going the professional route, it's I just kind of accidentally got into it. Um, I was looking for work after college. I uh, found a posting through the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, happened to get the job and it kind of, it really kind of helped shape my path forward. It kind of gave me some new ways to look at genealogy, um, some new paths and allowed me to really enjoy the career itself. And that's what got me going onto this path on the side, in addition to working for the DAR. Great. And so I was going to ask you about your day job. So the DAR, can you tell us what you act, what you do there and sort of what their interest in genealogy is? Sure. So our main focus for the genealogy department is um, verifying applications for new members and also additional lineages called supplemental applications for current members. Um, For anyone that can uh, document their lineage to a uh, person who contributed to the patriotic cause or served in the military um, during the American Revolution, 
I specifically work as a team leader. So I manage a group of genealogists themselves. Um, so I'm verifying their work as they're verifying papers to make sure they're following department policies. Okay. But um, I also do additional um, work myself in verifying papers. And then I'll occasionally dabble in some uh, additional special projects, um, things like that. So I'm, I'm just curious in, in that process, is that a, in, in terms of people, new new people looking to connect themselves and, and join the DAR, is that a, a dwindling population? Like is, at, at some point, will we have uncovered everyone or is, do you have a steady stream of applicants, I guess? There's always a steady stream. We've we've actually picked up quite a bit, and I mean we're still continuing to hire people because there's there's great demand, and the greater demand is for uh, the members that uh, put in supplemental applications. Um, we definitely have some job security there. There's a lot of papers that are coming in. Um, there's only so many of us working on them, so we we really try to get as much as we can done in a day. But um, there's it's there's really no dwindling population of it. And we continue to work on trying to find ways to uh, improve research and also just, you know, include more patriots, uh, what the definition of a patriot, uh, the different types of people that can be included in that. Yeah, let, let's elaborate on that a little bit. You, you mentioned it. So in terms of the DAR's process and, and rules, I guess. So to become a member, you have to have served or contributed, I think you said, right? So yes. what's, what's some of the examples of pretty, you know, military service, I think we can understand pretty straightforwardly, but what other contributions do you look at? So the eligibility is, is the eligibility clause that we call it that's on every application, and it has been since the uh, founding in the 1800s. Um, basically, the person has to have served an unfailing loyalty to the patriotic cause. And that can be whether they served in some kind of fashion, whether in military, and they served in the militia, they served in the state or continental line, uh, the navies, or they could contribute through patriotic service, which can be anything from uh, taking an oath of allegiance to the American cause or serving in committees, um, serving in any fashion that was geared towards helping the army or any kind of war effort, uh, raising taxes such as supply tax. Um, it could be um, furnishing supplies for the war effort. Uh, it could be having someone that was simply just captured as a prisoner of war by the enemy. Um, and then there's also what we have civil service, which is any kind of position um, on a local level that required taking an oath. Um, so long as that oath was under a state government at the time, which was under basically the Declaration of Independence, or at least not swearing oath of allegiance to the King of uh, King George at the time. Okay. And I've, I've, I can hear my culper spy ring historians <laughs> in the back of my head <laughs> raising questions. So we'll get to some of the, you know, the, how Long Island situation might complicate that thought. But I, I guess in terms, so how do you, when you look at an application or your teams do, are you, what, what role do you think you're playing? Are you like a lawyer or you're, you're, you're double verifying or like, how do you approach it? I kind of take it more like a a, a, t a teacher grading a paper um, okay. a lot of the time. It's because it's we, we have we have a double pronged approach with every application. It's verifying the lineage is correct, and then we have to look at the service. And we try to really stay fresh with guidelines and procedures when it comes to um, what service is acceptable, um, what sources can be used. And we try to really make sure everything is streamlined through um, using appropriate resources so that we don't have to keep going through every time and saying we have to re review that source every time, make sure that service is good. But it's more, it's, we don't really have to do that every time, but there are a lot of, let's say there's a lot of profiles in our database that have not had anybody that has uh, applied through for generations or decades. And a lot of times we have to go through and make sure that the research for both the lineage and uh, service, they're up to date and making sure that, you know, there are no issues with that person in general, especially when it comes to places like New York and making sure that they didn't have allegiances elsewhere or participate in other actions, which would have been contrary to their uh, patriotic cause. And I'm just curious, so as members are accepted, it, are the DAR records a, a publicly available resource for genealogists because all that work has been done to get in there? So we have the uh, genealogical research system, the GRS, as we call it. Um, that is a public database, and anybody can get into uh, have access to that um, and see any patriot that we do have established so far. And we, any patriot that we do have in our system is based on whether someone can claim membership through them. Okay, great. And it is another straight question. I've I've done genealogy myself off and on, and, and I started um, 
you know, in the microfilm era. So I'm, I'm just curious in your, your experience, did you start in the digital age or were you doing, I'm sure you had microfilm machines you had to use anyway, but where, where did you jump on board genealogy technologically wise? Uh, um, technologically, I mean, it was, it was already in that transition between microfilm and digital. I'll say I've, I've definitely been a little bit more spoiled with the, the digital era. And thankfully when it comes to um, resources like family search, how they've digitized everything and it's available right away. But I, I definitely have done my share of microfilm and having to go to archives where that's still kind of a thing. So I, I, I could work the, the best of both worlds. There. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it speaks to, you know, you're saying the steady stream of applicants as, as it becomes more accessible to do this kind of research to people, more people I, I think are getting into it and, and finding their own roots, which is great, mm -hmm. you know, just in general. So let's, let's get into the, the, the revolutionary war and particularly on Long Island. Do you want to, I can do it or if you want to do it, <laughs> do you want to give us an overview of? Sure. So, um, Probably one of the best ways to put everything is if ever, if anyone has watched the musical 1776, there was the whole part about New York and the representation just abstaining the whole time, abstaining. They they had no motions that were coming on because at the time their government was – they basically were comprised of merchants and aristocracy at the time that were very divided in their liberties between fighting for liberty and um, maintaining their allegiances with um, England just because – New York City was the biggest harbor at the time. It was one of the most important uh, in the world at the time, too, for any kind of trade in the colonial era. So uh, a lot of people were very divided about actually breaking away from it. So early on in the war, that was very much uh, an factor of, um, of activity that was happening there. But once Lexington had happened in Massachusetts in 1775, it became very clear that New York was going to become a focus of a lot of activity. Uh, for both sides, and uh, both sides recognized the importance that New York was going to have in the war, and that's why 1776 was a big year uh, for the British Army to land at Staten Island and in Manhattan. Washington's army moved in, leading up to the big battle of uh, Long Island, which ended up being a, a disastrous effort for Washington himself, who almost got court-martialed and uh, pretty much uh, let go from his position at the time because of that loss. But uh, once the British had taken over in the fall of 1776, um, rapidly you saw them gain their foothold in Manhattan, Staten Island, Queens and Kings, and then eventually Suffolk County, uh, setting up stations and forts all the way across all these areas. Um, basically, the area was under British occupation and under a constant state of uh, martial law. Uh, the courts were suspended, so there was no activity uh, in any of those courts for the most part, except for probate court, uh, the surrogates courts. And um, for the most part, otherwise, they used oaths of allegiance to police people, but there was a constant state of uh, watch and guard for people who may have um, been deemed inimical or assisting with any kind of illicit trade. Outside of that, there was very little activity in trying to recapture New York for the most part because within a few years, the focus had uh, shifted towards the Southern Campaign. New York basically became a, um, a, a station for uh, loyalist refugees and soldiers to uh, be stationed, and many of them were sent down from there to go fight in these areas, North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina. But it wasn't until um, 1782, to 1783 that you start seeing after uh, the Battle of Yorktown that uh, forces started um, making their preparations to evacuate. They started getting people moving to Nova Scotia or other British plantations or colonies at the time. And at the same time, too, um, you did start seeing some of the leaders of towns in Long Island. At least I can only at least at this point speak for Long Island, uh, Suffolk County specifically. Uh, for those that were starting to uh, reconcile with the mainland in New York and uh, working their way towards um, participating in state governments. And um, at that point, you started seeing people working their way towards their allegiances back to the U.S., the mainland, leading up to the evacuation day of uh, November 1783, which was also about the time we effectively recognized the end of the American Revolution. Okay. And so just to get to the oaths for a minute, so the, the British occupied it. Um, we, we talked to a few other people on you know, different episodes. It, it's interesting, and I don't know if you, if you have a, a strong opinion, but in, in terms of the way the British occupied the area and, and administered it, it seemed like 
they didn't quite <laughs> look to win the hearts and minds, or at least the further east on the island you went. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, do you see how how fully British do you see it when you when you look at the scope of, say, from Brooklyn out to? It, there, there's a there's a few uh, approaches to that, just depending on the locality, because it's interesting that when you look at the dates of the oaths, that does play a big factor in it. Um, the British landed in early July 1776. Almost immediately, Staten Island gave in five lists of oaths to the British, almost immediately, which says a lot about uh, Staten Island itself. Um, once the the battle had taken place at New York and Long Island, there were numerous remonstrances. There were a lot of petitions uh, from inhabitants of New York City uh, in New- the outward of New York um, to reconcile and reestablish allegiances with the king. Um, the official oath for New York was in January 1777. Queens County uh, was December 1776. Suffolk County was ideal- ideally the last area. Um, the oath out there wasn't subscribed till October 78. And it was that kind of thing where everything was centralized in New York itself at Staten Island. But within a couple of years, you started seeing the army start working their way eastward and setting up garrisons and blockades, forts, um, going further eastward. But yeah, the the further eastern areas of, of Long Island were, were very much kind of sparsely populated by any kind of British guard at the time. But um, I did notice um, reviewing the oaths for Suffolk County, for instance, which is we, we call that the Tryons list. And for that, it, it generally targeted only men of the age of militia, uh, a militia service. Um, but I did notice that there are some people outside of that age range. And I was you don't actually have the implications through the, the list itself, but it, there's some kind of idea that some people probably were targeted a little bit more just because of their influence in that area. So, so w- was the idea of this whole swearing to the oath? Uh, so, I don't know if, if you can walk us through the process. So a, a representative from the government would come out and what assemble the the a certain age men, I would guess, into the square, and they would raise their right hand. Or like, what did it look like swearing the oath? Or how did they keep records of that? I, I honestly don't have many descriptions of what the oath would have been subscribed by, but it would have been subscribed before some officials of the army itself. But there would uh, there are those as well, um, particularly in Staten Island, that are subscribed before particular justices of that jurisdiction. So it's something more to that approach. Um, I'm not sure in some areas if there was a deadline or not in order to apply. But for the most part, all these were subscribed in a very short period of time. So it does appear that there was some kind of word that was sent out in order for this to happen. And I, I don't know if this, I guess, you know, in, in terms of the contemporary mindset, because it, it strikes me as, as reading more into this, it, it almost like a medieval or, or, or naive, you know, were they actually relying on people's word to abide by this? Or was it more a legal document that if they had to go back and kill them, they could say you broke your oath or what, what was like the legal standing of the oath or, or how do you think they felt? Um, it, it was very much like you said there, it was, it was. Again, they were in a very much of a police state at the time, and everything was operated by the military. So it was one of those they can sit there and say, "Well, you took this oath, and therefore your life is on the line if we catch you um, acting otherwise." So it was very much that. What I did start seeing through as I was putting up uh, this collection of uh, for the loyal and doubtful, there are a couple of surviving examples of like basically you would take the oath, but then you were given a certificate that you kept on your person saying that you did uh, subscribe to this oath on this date. Um, an example of this ex- uh, exists through some uh, private collections in the New York Historical Society. Um, this is, I mean, it's one of the only examples I've ever seen of it, but it does pr- it does provide some further credence to, as to how all this was operated, that they uh, these people were all given an individual certificate that they carried on them in the case that something, you know, would go wrong or they were ever questioned for their allegiances. And and so to tie this back to the the DAR applications, is someone's name appearing on a loyalty oath a, a dead end? Is that like a, a hard a red flag, a hard no? <laughs> um, so the eligibility clause with the DAR is um, the person has to have served with unfailing loyalty. So we're based on a last act kind of situation where if the last act that we have of that individual is taking an oath of allegiance to the king or serving in other any fashion otherwise for the British cause, then that does 
um, well, let's say cancel out the patriotic service that they may have had prior to that event. But for anybody that's seeking membership through somebody, what they would have to do is if such an a, act of loyalism or dabble activity is identified, they would need to find an act of good patriotic service after that last act of um, loyalist activity. Okay. So what, what, what also strikes me, so you mentioned before that the, the whole, I think, seven years of British occupation was, was martial law and there's few courts running. So it was sort of a tumultuous time, and yet you're relying on a lot of record keeping. So there was record keeping going on. So what, what other sources? So the loyalty oaths, I guess, they were all saved, or do you have a good uh, understanding of all the oaths that were given? So we had relied on the longest time, um, the DAR staff, on a number of old sources that have been available for many years, um, but most of them were put together through um, reviewing petitions. Um, I, the Queens County Oaths, for instance, are known because they were published in newspapers at the time. And a lot of, if you go to any newspaper website like uh, Genealogy Bank, um, a lot of those are available on there. So these people were publicly um, identified by taking an oath. And I think Kings County was also the same way. Um, Staten Island was uh, the same. New York City, we hadn't really found a good source for their oaths other than through um, a book by Thomas B. Wilson called Inhabitants of New York, um, which had collected multiple petitions from October and November 1776. But they weren't exactly oaths of allegiance. They were basically people, residents from that city that were petitioning to Sir William Howe to try and um, restore their um, allegiances to the king and restore peace. But during the course of this and during the course of um, a work with a few of my co-workers, we did discover in the National Archives UK on their website that there is an entire oath list of everyone in New York City and the outward that had taken an oath, and there were over 3,000 names on there. And I had never seen that list published anywhere, so all of those names were applied here. Um, so there were some sources that were discovered during the process of this that um, I was able to incorporate in this. Right, and, and to go back to then the, the index you compiled, so you were looking for sources that documented actions that could be con con considered disloyal. or So beyond the oaths, what were some of the other documents that you could put into that index? Basically, again, we went with everything that we knew. So we went through all of our old resources and then started this whole search for finding new uh, sources or just f going through um, other sources that we were familiar with and trying to go through everything detailed. Um, the oaths is where I started is because that is the longest. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's several thousand names involved there alone. Um, there's over 2,000 names in the Tryons list for Suffolk County, over 3,000 for New York City. But then it also went through going through a number of petitions, and these are found in a lot of different areas. Again, uh, Thomas Wilson's Inhabitants of New York is one, but again, um, old newspapers, whether they were um, patriot or um, loyalist newspapers, often published a lot of their um, proceedings as well, and that was a good source. I did go through the loyalist claims from the National Archives uh, UK. Those, even though they have been published, I found a lot of the um, evidence claims for each of these uh, claims to be very helpful because it also pretty much damned other people that also served as witnesses to some of these. Yeah. Uh, because basically there were people that said, yeah, I, I was uh, carting provisions for this company at this time, and I verified that this person lost uh, such and such at the time. Um, and with the loyalist claims as well, I was basically scanning each and every one of them to see what kind of claim they were um, – these people were trying to seek money and reimbursement from from the British Treasury, and that alone kind of determined whether it was going to be whether it would be doubtful acts or not, because if the claim that they were seeking was reimbursement for their services as a you know for carting provisions or working on a fort a fortification, that's an act of uh, loyalty or doubtful behavior because that's an act they did, as opposed to you know. Colonel Simcoe came to my plantation and, and took five cows without my permission. That's an act of depredation, and that would not necessarily count in the same way. And yet, if you're living under martial law, it's hard to say no if they if they come exactly. and say we're going to buy your cart or something. Exactly. But the good thing I liked about a lot of those claims, and and not just in the loyalist claims, there are some other areas where you can find those kinds of things. But they are generally the claimants are very very descriptive and not only providing the date of that action but also stating whether they 
to, took those provisions to the army or whether someone else took them from their property. And that's how we kind of look at that action, whether it was duress or whether it was um, without will, things like that. So that, that's an interesting process. So the, the DAR, you know, I don't know if it goes up from you to, to the people making the decisions, but you're, you're weighing some very personal or, you know, social issues against the, the actual cut and dried record and, mm -hmm. and re not reading into it, but trying to interpret. So that's, that's an interesting uh, process and, and result of that. So is, is there either, either it exists or by implication, um, the, the opposite of your index would be sort of evidence of people who did something to redeem themselves for lack of a better word. Yes. <laughs> Does that um, exist, or where would you look to say, "All right, I'm 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 in your index, but my my ancestor went on to help somebody later in the patriot cause." There isn't anything so far as to what defines good service, because in when it comes to us at the DAR, we do have to in, we do have to interpret every uh, source that comes to us and and apply it towards our record and the mm -hmm. situation, and make sure that it does define um, good patriotic service. It's very hard for us to prejudge something on that in this case. But what we've been doing, and, and part of the this is part of the reason why I got into this big project in the first place, um, was Long Island and New York City has long been a, a, a black hole for us when it came to um, just anybody being able to apply because it's always been one of those whatever we got a paper on them, we were always bawling our eyes out because we hit like oh god now we have to go through this long intensive process of of looking through every source that we have or that we know mm -hmm. um is this person with good service is this a person of loyalist of uh, activity things like that so we really tried to work with what we could in reviewing every resource that we can reinterpreting things making sure that we had things right and that's how this came about and that's why as you said there was um reinterpreting some of the situations that came out of some of these like the claims for instance there are certain claims that we can look at as a depredation as opposed to an act of loyalism. So there, there are certain there are certain acts of, during this time that we can look at and reinterpret things based off of what is on the document, um, provided that it, again, is something that we can look at at face value without trying to create some kind of whole backstory that may not necessarily be at face value. And, and this is volume one. What's the projected number of volumes, do you think? So this one, I mean, I, I had no idea it was going to go as long as it did, but as I was putting all this together, um, I was amazed by just the length of other stuff that had been out that I was finding that I was that was not published through other resources. Um, I spent a lot of times a lot of times uh, scanning images through the uh, Canadian archives. Um, that was one of the biggest sources for me for a lot of this as well. Was going through a lot of um, papers through particular officers of the um, British Army. And I started coming across other lists of loyalist collections across the country, um, namely in New York. Um, there was a whole list put together by the American Antiquarian Society in the 1950s that I stumbled across. And that, you know, it, it was a 50-page document of collections in these libraries and historical societies. And there's going to be quite a few of those that I go through. So ideally, there, there's definitely going to be a second series. I don't know how many volumes I'm hoping it won't be too bad but there there's definitely going to be more coming forward well what what strikes me also is you you're in a unique position you tell me what you think but going through all these records you're holding in your head at least temporarily a, a very comprehensive picture of what life was like on Long Island during those years anything strike you beyond just the you know the the details you were looking for about stray facts that you saw or persons or situations that you saw in the records um it was interesting to start putting together some facts about what was going on on the on the town level in certain areas, and for the most part, there's not a great amount of detail that can be applied because, as I mentioned before, um, the courts were suspended. For the most part, a lot of town functions were also suspended. So, if you look through a lot of town records at this time for any of the places, uh, Brookhaven, um, Smithtown, etc you don't really have a whole lot of, of activity being written down other than town elections at the time. But the one that I hold uh, the most um, kind of allegiance to is the town records of Huntington, which were a lot more descriptive at the time. And there's a lot more that can be ascertained about what was going on during that period, uh, specifically about 1778 to 1780, in which you did have residents that were 
being called to guard or work on fortifications, cart provisions, etc. But there was also quite a few petitions from uh, British officers themselves or orders asking people to show up at this time to work on these fortifications, and they were getting resistance from people um, for doing anything. So the, you did start seeing that they're on a more a smaller level or even a more local level. There was some resistance. But at the same time, too, you kind of play it back and forth and start seeing that there's other areas where um, even some of these people were still thanking uh, local companies or rangers for their uh, hospitality, things like that. So it really seemed like everything was going back and forth as to, you know, were they friendly towards the British? Were they uh, resisting? There was a there was a lot of back and forth in it. So um, that was probably one of the more unique things about that. But aside from that as well, I was also interested in learning just certain areas were a bigger hotbed for activity than I'd previously thought, which uh, New York and Staten Island were a bigger hotbed of a loyalist activity than I thought. Just coming up with certain documents that I had never even heard of before, such as a loyalist declaration of independence. Hmm. What were they declaring their independence from? That one, so it, it, it is a so-called loyalist declaration of independence, not the official term. It's, it's, okay. it's the petition of 547 um, inhabitants of New York and Long Island. But basically, in their way, that was their pledge to uh, support British activity, to um, act against any orders of the Continental Congress, that they supported their reconciliation with um, England and, and would fight to support that. And it's a whole petition that's been digitized through the New York Public Library. And I had never known about it, and I've never seen it anywhere before until this. So that was an interesting uh, find as well. And it wasn't I, just people of New York City. I ended up, it, it doesn't specifically state uh, residences of where these people were from, but you can tell just by the clusters uh, where these people sign and also just knowing the genealogy of this area of uh, the families that were from particular towns like the Reeves, uh, the Corwins, the Conklins. You can tell that there were people from other areas uh, such as uh, Suffolk County and uh, Queens County on this list as well. Uh, th this might be beyond what you know you need to concern yourself with, but I'm just curious because I've been talking more about the loyalists and I, I don't know if you start to feel bad for them, but is, is are there are there associations where people are celebrating their loyalist ancestors, or or associations where they look for lists of loyalists to celebrate them, or are they kind of <laughs> forgotten in history, or people don't want to really? I, I haven't so much, and and this was doing this to begin with was almost I, I just kind of joke as a kind of a dangerous territory because I was always told that you know just this was a damning act because you know by identifying loyalist activity, we were preventing people from Long Island or anywhere with, that has Long Island connections from being able to join just because just because of the circumstances of just how that area was occupied and how the population was controlled at the time. But um, I really haven't had anybody so far kind of take the joy into this, this kind of you know activity for their ancestor, just because for the most part, um, I hear it from, they're looking for the more the patriotic side. They want to find that their ancestor was allegiant to the patriotic cause or that they served in some fashion to it, or they don't want to hear that the last act that they did was a loyalist act, even though they might have previously served in a patriotic fashion. So so that they don't really want to be in your book or in the index? The, the, they don't really want to, but I would, I would al always stress that there's, especially for the amount of uh, sources and um, finds that I was coming through as I was putting all this together, there's still quite a bit of things that are out there that have not been published. They may not be digitized. There's a lot still waiting to be found. And that goes not just for the loyalist side of things, but most certainly for the uh, patriotic side of things too. So there's, there's more to be unearthed as time goes by. And thank you again to Brendan. We will have links in our show notes to many genealogical and historical reference sources on today's topic that's at long island history project at gmail.com whether you've had an application come before him or not or you have dove into your own ancestors on long island hopefully you appreciate the care and skill and effort it takes to actually walk through all of these documents and if you are a genealogist you know how valuable a good reference source can be and if you have your own story to tell, if you've been doing your own research or a family story or some connection to Long Island history, we'd love to hear from you. You can drop us a line at longislandhistoryproject at gmail.com. This is our first episode of 2024, so Happy New Year. 
We've got a bunch of them lined up already. We're always looking for more, so stick with us. Hope you're enjoying them. Our outro music is Capering by the Blue Dot Sessions, used under an Attribution 4.0 international license. And as always, thank you for listening.